fun, of course. Hey, we're in a series on Jeremiah, which means you can open your Bibles up to Jeremiah chapter 1, and that's where we'll be for most of the message today. Jeremiah chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible with you, bring a Bible. We're going to be in Jeremiah all month long. It'll be helpful if you can be putting notes in your own Bible, taking notes, thinking through, and reading on your own alongside us. We've all likely been to the dentist at least once, hopefully a few times to have our teeth cleaned right. And there is no place like the dentist's chair to do some serious thinking. Isn't that true? I mean, you're laying down, you're staring at the ceiling, or you're glaring at that supernova-like light that they've got on the boom arm hanging above your head. And one of two things is generally happening as you're there in the dentist chair. Either the dental hygienist has decided that she wants to have a conversation with you, which is a challenge because you've got a vacuum tube and several implements in your mouth. And that, of course, requires that you play an impromptu game of horizontal charades while making a variety of noises, hoping to convey your meaning while trying not to choke on your own saliva. The second status is when your dental hygienist relents on the questions and you are left with your thoughts, which, depending on how the cleaning is going, might actually be the worst state of affairs. I didn't mind the scraping so much back when they used to scrape, but now they have introduced some torment device, some kind of water cutter uh, that is jetting cool water, a cutting force at your teeth and gums, combining the most irritating noises you've ever heard with discomforting vibration and the occasional stab of dental nerve pain. What fun. It is a great time to think. And if you're anything like me, the question you ask yourself as you lay there looking at the ceiling or at that light is, why am I here? Now, I don't mean why am I here in like some kind of metaphysical way, like why are any of us here? More, why are we here? Like, why do I go to the dentist? Why do I subject myself to this? Why do I sit willingly in this chair and have this experience? I mean, after all, no animal would just lay there with its mouth open with such discomfort and noise. A beast in this circumstance would either bite or it would bolt. It would not just lay there. But you are no mere beast. It is a profoundly human experience to place yourself in a position of discomfort because you know it's the right thing to do. Because it's the hard thing to do. Because you know that the ends justify the means. Because you understand that as bad as the situation might feel in the moment, it could be much worse if you're not willing to be uncomfortable for just a minute right now. Being fully human, to be truly human, means to choose our discomfort. Sometimes saying no to ourselves. Do you say no to yourself? It means... Choosing to say things that are unpopular, it means choosing against your animal instincts. It means doing things not because you want to do them, not because you enjoy them, not because they come naturally to you, but because it is the right thing to do. The story of Jeremiah's prophetic ministry begins with a call. It's not a call to glory. It's not a call to personal pleasure. It is, in fact, though, a call to significance. I'm asking you to do something that has meaning. The story of Jeremiah's calling is not merely a biographical account. This is not just history for us to read and go, oh, that's interesting that that guy had to go through that a long time ago. The story of Jeremiah's calling is a snapshot of the relationship between God and every faithful believer in a rebellious culture. This is a story of God calling a person to do the hard thing, to take an uncomfortable and very unpopular stand, Calling a person to stand against an entire culture. Does that call sound familiar to you? Let's go to our master in prayer. Our Lord and God, you who forged the cosmos and had in mind the idea that we would be in this room today, we ask you to speak to us. We ask that through your Holy Spirit you speak through these scriptures we're going to read and study today, that you change us because of who you are. Help us to see you more clear, I, clearly. I pray every person in this room goes forth from this room different because we have heard from you today. Would you be with us in this study, Lord? We ask it in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to start today by talking about Jeremiah as a reluctant ambassador. Secondarily, we're going to talk about God identifying what's going on with the status of Jeremiah. He's going to say, this is who you are. And in a sense, 
God is going to be identifying who you are in that context as well. And lastly today, we're going to talk about the unpopular message. Today's message is actually messenger of the exile. And so in order to be a messenger, you have to have a message. Oh, you guys are good. Absolutely right. So we're going to talk about that message as we go along today too. We'll deal with that in greater depth next week as we look at the message of Jeremiah. Have you ever gotten a phone call you didn't want? Get one during this service? Before the era of cell phones, there was a time, I'm going to tell you a story, young ones. There was a time when phones were physically attached to a device, which was attached to a wall, which was attached through a a wire to a phone line. And it went to some facility where they transitioned calls to calls. It was a spectacular, mysterious time. But in that time of world history, there was no way to tell who was calling you. The phone rang and you picked up the phone. And then you had to find out who was there. You would answer with a hello. And then you would find out who was on the other end. Sometimes much to your chagrin as you realized it was a call that you did not want to take, especially as the telemarketing enterprise really got going. In 1993, something was introduced called caller ID. Caller ID was where you could look at a, your phone device and it would list out the number that was on the, the, per, the person who was calling you. And this might seem strange, but back in that era, most human beings had dozens and dozens, if not a hundred different phone numbers memorized. And so you could look and go, I don't know that person. Or yes, that is Chris, or that's whoever, right? Now, people rushed to spend the extra money to find out who was calling them back in the 90s. Nowadays, cell phones do much of that work for us automatically. We can assess whether or not we want the call. As I was actually writing this illustration, I began receiving a call from Sirius XM. My phone let me know. Sirius XM's calling. You know what they were calling me for? Hey, your free subscription is almost up. Would you, would you like to, re- it's, it's going to be canceled if you don't do something about it. Oh, yes. And of course, I ignored it. The story of Jeremiah begins with a call. And it's a call that he probably wanted, but he also probably did not want. And I, I imagine it was a mixed bag of emotions when he received this call from God. Because on the one hand, you've got elation because God has spoken to you. The God of the universe is speaking to you. But on the other hand, you are filled with dread because the God of the universe is speaking to you. It would be terrifying. And especially when God brought forth the message. Jeremiah is in a position where he has resignation to duty. I know that God wants something from me. And now I have to do it. Let's talk about the calling. It's a familiar setup. As Sean mentioned last week, Jeremiah is young and he's of a priestly line, possibly a son of an exiled high priest. He's a nobody. Jeremiah's in anybody. Jeremiah's in everybody with one exception. He's heard from Yahweh. God spoke to Jeremiah. Look at Jeremiah 1 verse 4. Now the word of the Lord came to me. Would you say that with me? Now the word of the Lord came to me. This is how it begins. It's hard sometimes to relate to a prophet. Is it hard for you when you hear of someone who hears a word directly from God? Somebody who stands in the presence of God and receives directly from God. Does such a person seem like they're in a whole different category than you are? Somebody entirely different than you. Oh, to have a word from the Lord. If only God would speak to me. If only I were the one who had a charge from God's word to carry forth. Oh, wait. Seems kind of like I do. I call this a familiar setup because God's word has come down to you. Now, it is in a form that may be somewhat less audible, but it is significantly more complete than the word Jeremiah had. And who are you? Who am I to receive such a word from God? A nobody? And anybody? And everybody? Yeah, with one exception. You have heard from Yahweh. God starts speaking to Jeremiah, and the first thing he says to him is, I know you, I know who you are. Jeremiah 1, verse 4 and 5, let's look at the text. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. Most of us have this fear. 
kind of deep within us that if somebody really knows who I am, they will reject me. If anybody could see behind the veil, if anybody knew the thoughts that were in my mind, if anybody knew how sarcastic and mean-spirited I could be, if only they knew what goes on in my head, I would not have a single friend. I love the way God starts this discussion with Jeremiah. Before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. God's eternal heart has wrapped around his chosen ones. Before cells even begin dividing, if you belong to God, he knows you. And he still loves you. But that's just Jeremiah, right? I mean, Jeremiah has this special place of privilege where God knows him. Oh, wait, David also says the same thing in the Psalms. David, in Psalm 139, verses 13 through 16, says something very similar. Listen, for you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance. And in your book were written all the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. Okay, so Jeremiah and David, they have that experience. But oh, Isaiah also says that to all the people of Judea. Isaiah 44, verse 2. Thus says the Lord who made you and formed you from the womb, or informed you from the womb, who will help you. Okay, so it's David and Jeremiah, and through Isaiah and his message, it's all the people of Israel. But it's more than that. Jeremiah is told that he's set apart. It's not just that God knows him before he's born. You're set apart. What does set apart mean? We've got another word for that in Christianity. It's what? Holy, very good. To be set apart is to be holy, set apart for the purposes of God. And this is what God says about Jeremiah. Look at 1 verse 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated, underline consecrated in your Bibles. That means to make holy. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. Okay, so it's Jeremiah and it's David. And through Isaiah, it's the people of Israel. But Paul says this too in Galatians chapter 1, verse 15. This also seems to be a New Testament concept. Galatians 1, 15 and 16. But when God, who had set me apart even from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. Wow. Can you imagine? Called before you're even born, set apart for a specific purpose. Must be nice to be specifically chosen by God for a task of great importance. Well, you should know. You experience the same thing. Listen to Ephesians 1, verse 4 and 5. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy, consecrated, and blameless before him in love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will. Listen to the way it's said in Ephesians 2, verse 10. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Who has God prepared for good works? Us. If you are in Christ, that is you. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, but you are chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you might proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So wait. What are we saying here? I've been created by God. He knew me before I was even formed in my mother's womb. Not just created, but I, I have been anointed. You have been anointed, set apart, holy for a specific purpose of God. There's got to be some mistake. That's what Jeremiah said. You ever set out to correct God? Sorry, Lord, you must not understand the situation. Have you ever had the experience of someone who knows significantly less than you trying to correct and inform you on something you're an expert in? Ever happen? It's difficult to control your face or hold back your sarcasm. It's difficult to not lay out a case meant to embarrass the person. What must it be like to be God 
when a human tries to tell him that he's mistaken. Everyone say this, I'm incapable. Are you? Yeah. Yeah, I'm incapable. I can't, I can't do this. What you're asking me to do, I can't do. Now, let me just say this. What is your excuse that you use when you're talking to God? You know what I mean? Like the excuse you use when you're telling God no, when you're telling God he made a mistake, like all of us do this. Every one, I guarantee you, every one of you, if you've been a Christian for long enough, you've probably said to God, no, nah, not me. Why? I'm too busy with work. I mean, God, you know how work is for me right now. I'm, I'm just waiting till I'm done with school. When I'm an adult, then I'll, I'll be an adult with regard to the kingdom work as well. Or I don't talk very well, or I don't talk very good. How about I'll look foolish? Or how about this? God, I will make you look foolish if I try to do what you're asking me to do. After I study more, then I'll be ready. After I've got more life experience, then I'll do what you're calling me to do. I, I can work if you'll just let me work with my kind of people, but it seems like you're asking me to meet with all kinds of people. Or my giftedness, God, is really in other areas. I feel like I really serve best in this way. Honestly, don't be vague with yourself. I'm serious here. Think about this for a moment. What do you say to God when you say no? When you say, I'm not going to do what you're asking me to do. Jeremiah 1.6, here's what Jeremiah said. Then I said, alas, Lord God, behold. If you've got your Bibles, underline the word behold there because this word is going to keep occurring in this text. Behold, here's what behold means. We don't say it very often. Like, behold, I'm about to preach a sermon, right? Behold means look, look intently, examine what I'm telling you right now. And so this is Jeremiah saying to God, he's like, God, I want you to look a little closer at what you're, you've been asking here. I think you're making a mistake. I just want you to look close. Maybe your eyesight's not great. Take a look at the person you're talking to. Behold, I do not know how to speak because I am a youth. Listen up, kids. Listen up, teenagers. How old was Jeremiah when God called his life to do the things he was doing? Estimates range from between 10 years old and 20 years old. Can you imagine this call coming to a 10-year-old? Now, most scholars fall out in the range of about 14 to 15 years old. So I want you to imagine that, 14 to 15 years old, and he's saying to God, like, nobody is going to respect me. Was Jeremiah's excuse valid? I'm going to say yes. I'm going to say absolutely. It was, inval it was, it was valid. Do adults typically listen to teenagers when teenagers wax eloquent with wisdom to them? Think of a 40-year-old and a teenager comes up to them and says, let me explain love to you. Now, don't be offended, guys, if you're younger in this room and you're hearing adults laugh. I promise you, you will do the same thing when you're their age. If a teenager says to an 80-year-old, I'll explain to you a few things about finance. Right? Generally, it's just going to be disregarded. Now, here's Jeremiah, and he is a very young man. He probably does not even have the beginnings of a beard yet. And God is saying to him, I expect you to go to powerful people, and you're going to explain my message to them. Jeremiah's like, look closer, God. You don't want me. I'm too young to be doing this. Jeremiah's concern was valid, but it was ultimately irrelevant. Why? Because your inadequacy is irrelevant. I'll say it again. Your inadequacy to do the work of the Lord, to do what he's calling you to do, is irrelevant. It doesn't matter if you're inadequate. Your inadequacy and your excuses to God, your excuses are you trying to talk yourself into disobedience. I want to say it again. That's important. When you make an excuse to God, when you tell God why you can't, you are simply excusing your disobedience. Jeremiah 1, verse 7. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am a youth, because everywhere I send you, you shall go, and all that I command you, you shall speak. Jeremiah, you young? Yeah, I don't care. You're going to do what I'm telling you. Here's where this begins to get a bit uncomfortable for most of us. We would like to compartmentalize all of these things and say, 
this is a separate category. This is not me. This is Jeremiah. Jeremiah, it's his story, and he's a prophet. And so his story is radically different from my own story because he, Jeremiah, had a word from God. I mean, Jeremiah heard from God. He knew what God said, and he had a message that he was told to carry for God, and that's different from me. Isn't that different from me? What do you have? You have all of Jeremiah's words. You have the words of Moses. You have the words of the law and the prophets. You have the Psalms and you have the Proverbs. And Jesus Christ showed up on earth as the word, the incarnate word of God. And you've heard from him and you've accepted him. And he's in your life and through the Holy Spirit, he speaks through and teaches you and guides and directs you. You have the words of the apostles. You have the words of the early church fathers. You've got the words of people who've walked with the Lord throughout the history of Christianity. What do you have? I guarantee you, if you are in Christ, you have the word of God. It's in you. It's meant to come out of you. Yeah, yeah, but Jeremiah was charged by God to actually say something. I mean, God didn't command me to... Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore into all the nations, making disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then he says this, and I want you to remember this for the rest of this sermon. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I will always be with you, is what Jesus says. So that command... The Great Commission, what we call the Great Commission, it's Jesus saying, here's the one thing I want you to do. And there's one command in the scripture. It is make disciples, make disciples. And it's augmented by several other things. Make disciples by going, make disciples by baptizing, make disciples by teaching them to obey all I've commanded you. I'm calling you, make disciples. You have a command. God didn't tell me to do that, did he? I mean, he told the preacher to do that. He's calling each and every believer to take this up as a personal mission. Let's talk about your status. That's a pretty heavy call, isn't it? For the God of this universe to be like, I'm putting you in charge of making disciples. God's going to talk to Jeremiah here, and he's going to say to this messenger, he's going to say, I know what is going on inside of you when I tell you to do this. I know what's going on in you. I know what my call is doing to you inside of you. Have you ever noticed how weddings have a disproportionately high level of freaking out? Freaking out and sometimes passing out and occasionally running out, right? It, it's sort of a strange phenomenon, but when you think about all that's happening, you kind of understand why, right? It's producing high emotion. There's, there's social stresses. There's performance pressure. There's physical exhaustion. And I would suggest there are actually spiritual shock waves coming out because who ultimately joins the two? God. And so something supernatural is actually happening in that moment. What's really going on in a wedding is radical life change is taking place. An earth permanent contract is taking place. And two people's lives are being radically joined together, altered in status. When I'm doing weddings, I usually grab the best man and I pull him aside apart from the groom. And I say, listen to me, you've got one job today. Keep him from freaking out. What I want you to do is I want you to just be there with him. I want you to talk to him. I want you to keep his mind on the good things that are coming. Uh, don't, don't let him think about all the minutia. I want you to assure him that you're in his presence, that you care about him, that he's making the right decision. Help him, right? What's true of weddings is very much true in life. Jeremiah gets God's call, and when he gets God's call, it comes with an implicit freak-out option. If you take it seriously, this will freak you out. It will terrify you same kind of freak out option that you and I get when we take God's command seriously. You really want me to do that? God says, you're afraid. Now let's talk about the state of fear for a moment. The fear is a noun and fear is a verb, right? You can have fear. It's a thing that you can have, or you can fear something. That's an action you engage in. Being in a state of fear is natural. It's normal. We all experience that sometimes. Is it disobedience? To experience fear? No. Is it sin to experience fear? No. 
But if we choose to embrace and give ourselves over to the state of fear, particularly fear of the wrong things, then we are engaged in sin. And so comes God's command in verse 8. Look at verse 8. Do not be afraid of them. Now, who do you tell to not be afraid? Somebody who's experiencing what? Fear, okay? So God's saying, I know your state. Your state is fear right now. And God does not say, do not fear me. He says, do not fear them. Don't fear anyone else. Don't fear anybody else out there. For I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Do you remember what Jesus said when he gave us the Great Commission? I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is the same thing God is saying to Jeremiah. I'm with you, Jeremiah. I'm asking you to do something hard, but I'm with you. I'm there beside you. This is what Jesus says to you. I'm with you. In the midst of the difficult thing I'm calling you to do, I'm with you. Does companionship take the edge off of fear? It does. I like snorkeling. I like getting into salt water with lots of things that are moving around me, some that are a little bit scary and colorful. Uh, I enjoy it. My wife, not so much. Uh, every time we end up somewhere where there's clear water and heat and uh, we're jumping into the water, she is always reticent to get in because we've all seen Shark Week, right? But something happens every time we're in that condition a bunch of people jump into the water, and then she goes in, and she's fine. Why? Because she's not there alone. If she gets eaten by a shark, at least she was with people. Now, all the danger, all the danger is still there, but there's something about being with other people that helps to diminish our sense of fear. This is probably best exemplified with junior high boys, uh, and you guys will probably agree to this. Junior high boys... Uh, I remember being a junior hire. None of us is as stupid individually as we are collectively. <laughs> uh, put us in a group, put us in a group, and it's like that part of our brain that's like survival instinct, don't do that, just shuts off, right? Uh, and so there is a sense in which it helps people to overcome fear, to have somebody with you. But listen, depending on who you have with you, this could be a really powerful experience. Let's imagine that your companion is entirely reliable. I mean completely reliable. That your companion is strong. How strong? The absolute strongest. That your companion is loyal. The greater the companion, the greater the encouragement. So what does it mean to say, God is with me? Chris Carter in class uh, said this morning, and I'm like, that's in my sermon. He said, uh, he said, God plus one person equals a majority. Technically, God equals a majority. And then if you're the one person who happens to be on his side, congratulations, you're in the majority, right? Romans 8.31 expresses this sentiment. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is with me, if God is my companion, what do I have to fear? Fear may be natural, but uh, perspective here, perspective about who's with you should temper your choice to embrace fear. God turns it even a little bit more in the next passage in verse 9. He kind of implies that they should be the ones who are afraid. Look at verse 9. Then the Lord stretched out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, there's that word again. Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. Do you remember what Jeremiah said to God? He said, Behold, check it out. I'm a youth and I don't know how to talk. And God says, Behold, I, the ancient of days, am putting my words in your mouth. Does it matter if you can't talk? No, they're my words. Does it matter if you're young? No, I'm eternal. Behold, I am putting my words in your mouth. You might not think that's very scary. What's so scary about a word? Why should that evoke terror in an audience? Because they're God's words. And with God's word, he spoke the cosmos into being. With God's words, he destroys armies. With the word of God, he will judge the nations. God's word is terrifying. It's powerful. Christian, he has put his words into your heart and in your mind. What comes out of you and what comes through you when you speak the word of God is powerful, and it should be terrifying to everyone else who receives it. That makes you intimidating, not because of you, but because of the one who is with you. Isn't that a bit dramatic, though? I mean, just aren't we being a little hyperbolic? I mean, after all, Jeremiah is just going to deliver a message. Isn't he just a messenger boy? 
Listen to what God describes Jeremiah's condition as being. He essentially says to him, I'm going to make you a cosmic wrecking ball, Jeremiah. Look at verse 10. See, I have appointed you this day over the nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build up and to plant. Jeremiah's appointment is going to make him the fulcrum of Middle Eastern history. He is going to be the voice of eternal condemnation for those who will not listen and a voice going forward to warn everybody else in the same condition. God's word is not mere wind. God's word is powerful. Amen. Isaiah 55, 11 says this. So my word will be which goes forth from my, wow, my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. Sean said it well last week, and I want to keep cycling back to this through this series. Remember, God's word will bring about one of two results. It will either be that repentance and restoration on one hand. A person gets their life right, or secondarily, it is ripening a hearer for judgment. Your words do that. When you speak the word of God to another person, you either bring them into proximity to God. They either hear you and think, I need to fix my life, or they hear you and think, I want nothing to do with that. And in one sense, they're coming to salvation. In the other sense, God will judge them and he'll go, I provided you the opportunity. Did you not hear my word coming to you? What does that have to do with me? What does God's word in my mouth do? I mean, really, I'm, am I really expected to think that what I say in my small sphere of influence is going to overthrow nations? Hey, guys, if I wrote a book and that book were being quoted a thousand years from now, would you say that I'd had pretty serious impact? If I sculpted a statue and it were still around and receiving viewers a thousand years from now, would you say that I'd made an impact on planet Earth? That's merely a thousand years. What if your words, what if your works crafted something eternal? In the scripture, we read that when we talk, when we Christians talk to one another, there is a scroll of remembrance being written down that will be kept for eternity. Did you realize that? That even now, as words are being spoken, as you came in and as you left and spoke to other believers, words of remembrance are being written down. Our every encounter with one another is being recorded for posterity's sake. What if you, the person sitting in your chair, what if that person could change all of human history, carrying forth a chain of faith throughout all of human history and into eternity? What if untold armies of people would be saved because of your faithfulness right now? What if old untold armies of people would be condemned because you were being faithful right now? That's Jeremiah's legacy too. Is that being hyperbolic? Is that exaggerating? No. Think about this for just a second. You are the, you're right now, you individuals are, in, are part of a chain of faith. Somebody was faithful to bring you to God. And somebody was faithful to bring that person to God. And somebody was faithful to bring that person to God. And if we follow that chain back, it goes all the way to Jesus of Nazareth. You are a link in that chain. Now, the question before you is, will you be faithful as a link in that chain and connect up to other people and other circumstances? Through your faithfulness, will the chain of faith move forward? Or will you be unfaithful and be the end of that chain link? If the world endures a thousand years, Will there be millions of people in the kingdom of God because you chose to do the hard thing today? Do you realize what our small acts of obedience do? Do you have any idea what our faithfulness right now does with regard to eternity? An enduring and everlasting impact. Let's talk very briefly about the unpopular message. Back in my college days, I was uh, attending Bible college before I went to Miami University. And uh, in that time frame, I was significantly more agile than I currently am. Uh, let's, let us say that my frame contained far less mass. Uh, leaving the dorms, I lived on the third floor. There were numerous flights of stairs between the different levels of the dormitory. And uh, I regularly would just leap from the first landing to the second landing, just bypass all the stairs. 
uh, Spider-Man style, you know. Well, one day I decided, I was leaving with a whole group of friends, and I decided, you know what, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go clear to the bottom of the dormitory without stepping on a single stair. I'm just going to jump from landing to landing. And it was pretty amazing at first. I jumped, landing, landing, you know, and just hitting and like going to the Spider-Man crouch and just leaping to the next one. And uh, about, uh, about, I think it was about three or four levels down, hard to remember at this stage of the game. Uh, I leapt, and as I leapt from the stairwell, I realized midair, you know, it was one of these stairwells where everything's painted the same color. I realized midair that there was a wall between me and the next landing. It's one of the low hanging walls that came down and I could just see it coming from my head. Have you ever been in a situation where you see something imminent and there is no way to stop it? Contrary to most Japanese anime, you cannot change direction in midair. Once you're there, you're just going. You can't stand there and yell at the other guy or anything. And, and so here I was flying through the air and I knew I was gonna hit. And so I just leaned my head back a little bit, trying to catch more of a glancing blow than a direct shot. And I hit with my head, side of my head, uh, and it lifted my leg, because I, I had velocity going down, <laughs> lifted my leg straight up. So I took a fall from about seven to eight feet, flat on my back after having a <laughs> skull jarring impact in route. I saw it coming. There was nothing I could do about it. And this is, again, one of those examples of guys being more stupid together than they are apart. I wouldn't have done that if I didn't have a group of friends following me down the stairs, who then proceeded to be good friends and laugh at me for several minutes. <laughs> I saw it coming. Couldn't stop it. This is essentially the message of God for Jeremiah. He's like, Jeremiah, you're going to tell them these things. And you're going to tell them what they can do to fix it. And they're not going to do it. You're going to tell them what's coming. And they're not going to listen to you. And they're going to hate you and they're gonna ignore you, and they're gonna despise you because you're telling them the truth. Tell them, you can't get out of it, you're just gonna to have to flinch and turn your head a little bit, but you're gonna get hit, everybody is going to get hit. He starts his discussion with Jeremiah by asking, are you seeing this? Every time people pick up a microphone to check it out, it's testing, testing, one, two, one, two, three, right? And, and this kind of seems like what, Jer what God's doing with Jeremiah here at the outset. Look at this, see if you see this with me. Jeremiah 1, verses 11 and 12. The word of the Lord came to me saying, what do you see, Jeremiah? And I said, I see a rod of an almond tree. Then God said to me, you've seen well, for I am watching over my word to perform it. It always struck me that this was kind of like God was holding up flashcards to Jeremiah, like, all right, what's this? A rabbit. Okay, good. What's this? A kitten. What's that? That's a rod of an almond tree. Yep, good. We're on the same page. That's not actually what's happening. God's doing more than that here. Before we unpack this vision, though, I want you to look down at verse 13. Look at the, the start of verse 13. The word of the Lord came to me a second time. Now, that might not seem significant to you, but here's what this says. If the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, and then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah a second time, that means this is not the same revelation. In other words, the first revelation Jeremiah has is just this story. What'd you see? The rod of an almond branch. And that was his message. That could have been his message for hours or days or weeks or months. We have no idea how long that was the one vision that he was to proclaim to the people, which means he's walking around going, here's, what, here's what's going on, guys. I saw the branch, a, a, a rod of an almond tree. And God says he's watching over his word to perform it. People will be like, really? That's what God said? Okay. But here's the thing about this. This first snippet, this first small vision that Jeremiah has given, uh, it had some fun wordplay that people would have been repeating. And it was also very cryptic. Most people who heard this probably could not figure out what God was communicating through this. Let's talk a little bit about what it means. The almond tree is what is known in the, the Mediterranean region as a watcher tree, a watcher tree. And so remember, God says, I am watching over my word. A watcher tree, this, the reason it was called a watcher tree was the almond tree was one of the first trees to bear signs of new life in the spring. It was deemed a watcher tree because when it started budding, it was signifying that it was time to begin planting. It was going to let you know that something was about to happen. The term almond in the Hebrew is saked, and the term for watching is soked. So you see, God's using this wordplay, and people would have 
probably heard it and they would have been reciting it like, oh, that's kind of a cool little wordplay back and forth, the Saked and Soked. A more memorable connection would have been made and it was easy to repeat. So it would have been making the rounds through most of the people in Judea. Uh, did you hear a new prophet's arisen? Really? Yeah, his name's Jeremiah. It's a kid. Doesn't even have a beard yet. <laughs> what did he say? He said, there's an almond rod and God's watching over his word. That's weird. Now, some of your versions might render this as an almond branch. That's not a great translation. The term is an almond rod, and that's different. Let me try to explain it this way. Um, for those old timers in the room, uh, if I said, uh, go out and cut a switch, and then I brought a switch back and I said, look, a switch, you wouldn't be like, oh, spring is here. <laughs> what would you think of? Discipline, all right? D you're going to get whooped. Uh, let me explain something to the younger people and those of you who maybe have not had the blessing of physical discipline. Uh, back back in, in, in times bygone, it's still in some households, when kids were acting up, a parent would go, go cut a switch. And they would have to go out and cut a branch and trim it up and bring it in and hand it to dad. And dad would go, not thick enough, try again. And they'd have to go out and cut another switch and they'd come back and you were going to get whooped with that stick. Why? Because you did something bad. And so here's the word that's being used, a rod from an almond tree, a switch. And so people would likely just be going, well, what's he saying? Is he saying that like it's a new beginning, like it's spring, or is he saying he's going to punish us? And the answer is, yes, that's what he's saying. This is a new beginning for you. Punishment is inbound. Now, the second uh, vision that Jeremiah has is a boiling pot. Look at Jeremiah 1, verse 13 and 14. The word of the Lord came to me a second time saying, what do you see? And I said, I see a boiling pot facing away from the north. And the Lord said to me, out of the north, the evil will break forth on all the inhabitants of the land. So get, get the vision here. Imagine I, I'm holding a cauldron and you see just bubbling, it's bubbling from the top, steam's rising out. And I just begin kind of tottering forward toward you guys in the front row, just tipping. What are you doing? My guess is you're bolting, falling over backwards, you're flipping out, you're moving, right? And so here's the vision. I see it, a cauldron. It's about to spill out. This boiling liquid is about to pour forth on the nation. And God further says then, here's what's going to happen. Your neighbors are moving in. So some disaster is coming from the north. Look at verse 15. For behold, I'm calling all the families of the kingdoms of the north, declares the Lord, and they will come and they will set up each one his throne at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem and against all its walls, round about uh, against all the cities of Judah. It would be like this. It would be like if somebody came and said, there will not be a city, township, or village in the United States where some other government has not set up its rule. If you knew that was inbound right now, how would you feel? This is the message that is coming to the people of Judah. All authority, all sovereignty as a nation is about to be stripped away. Notice that it is all the cities of Judah. There's not a place you can hide from this judgment that's coming. There's no escape. And people will then ask, why is this happening? And Jeremiah had a ready-made answer. Verse 16, I will pronounce my judgments on them concerning all their wickedness, whereby they have forsaken me. They've forgotten me. They've set me aside. And they've offered sacrifices to other gods and worshiped the works of their own hands. Why? Why is this happening? Because you've forgotten the source. You've forgotten the God who delivered you, who pulled you out of slavery, who blessed you, who set you in this land, who feeds you and cares for you. You've forgotten him. Not only that, you're chasing other gods. You're worshiping anything else that gives you gratification. You're actually building things with your own hands and you're falling down in front of those things because things matter to you more than God does. Pause. Does that sound familiar? Have you ever seen a nation forget God? A nation that disregards his promises? A nation that forgets his many blessings? A, a nation that forgets that to defy God and to spit in God's faith, faith is, is to invite his curses upon that nation? A people who forsake him, who forget him, who say, remove yourself. We don't want to hear from you. We don't want to know who you are. 
Have you seen a nation and people set up something else to worship? Maybe a people who would fall down in front of any piece of technology they, they deem worthy, or money, or anything else. Have you ever seen a nation do something like that? God says to Jeremiah, prepare to take a stand. I have some relatives in Maine, uh, and the house that they live in, when it was built, they began digging to put in a basement, and what they uncovered was a giant piece of granite. And so they, were all, they already dug most of the, the foundation, and so they just filled in three walls of concrete, and then one whole wall is just granite rock. Right, just comes right down to the house. Now, it's, it's there. It's occupying a whole lot of basement space. What do you think they'd have to do if they decided they really wanted to get rid of that granite? Not going to happen. I'm sure it weighs probably three times the weight of the whole rest of the house put together. It's huge. It's enormous. You couldn't shake it loose. Keep that memory in mind. Here's a thing that's present. You can't get rid of it. God says to Jeremiah, put on your fighting pants. Put on your fighting pants. Look at verse 17. Now gird up your loins and arise. Uh, if you've got kids in the house, it's a great way to get them out of bed in the morning. Gird up your loins and arise. <laughs> gird up your loins and arise and speak to them all which I command you. Do not be dismayed before them or I will dismay you before them. Now, what does this mean? Gird up your loins. This is not a phrase most of us use on the regular. In this era, people wore robes. And if you needed to do hard work, here's what you did. You would take your robe and you would gather it up and you would tie it off in such a way as to liberate your legs so that your legs were free and you were wearing what were essentially shorts. So what's this saying? It's saying the man of God, before he goes forth and speaks, must put on a pair of shorts. <laughs> that's, that's not really what that's saying. You're reading different experiences into the text. It's, that, it's saying get ready, because here's, here's the deal. A person would gird up their loins when it was time to fight or with time to work really hard. He's saying to Jeremiah, get your expectations together here, buddy. You're going to have to engage in a big fight. It's coming up. You're going to have to work very hard. Are you ready? Get ready. He says to Jeremiah, manage your expectations. Now he's telling him, be, be more afraid of me. Have, have fear of me rather than fear of men. And can I exhort you in that regard today too? Stop caring so much about what they think. Fear God. Fear him first and foremost. Let that fear drive you to do the right thing. Galatians 1.10 says this. He says, uh, am, am, I, am, am I now concerned about men or of God? Am I trying to win the approval of men or God? If I'm trying to win the approval of men, I'm not a servant of Jesus Christ. Who do you care about? Manage your expectations. Now listen to what he says to Jeremiah. He's like, this is what it's going to be like, Jeremiah. Listen, Jeremiah 1 verses 18 and 19. Now behold, you look, I have made you today as a fortified city and as a pillar of iron and a bronze wall against the whole land, to the kings of Judah, to its princes, to its priests, to the people of the land. They will fight against you, but they will not overcome you, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Listen to the opposition that he's telling Jeremiah he's going to face. Kings, plural. In other words, Jeremiah, your prophetic rule is going to outlast many kings, and they're going to hate you. They're going to come against you. It's princes, and, and by this we mean the ambitious rulers of royal households, the nobles, the people who are out to make a name for themselves by denigrating people and driving them down. It would be like if I said to you right now, the wealthiest people, the wealthiest 5% of the people in the United States are going to be out to get you. Those people have clout. They can do things to me. The priests are going to come against you. It's not that you're going to be speaking on God's behalf and religious people will surround you. Jeremiah, I'm telling you, the religious leaders are going to be attacking you. They're coming after you. They've set themselves against God and they're going to set themselves against you. And also the people of the land. You're not even going to enjoy popular support. Everyone is going to hate you, Jeremiah. That's what you like to hear from God. Thanks, Lord. Thank you for appointing me to such a task. Do you think Jeremiah is a little intimidated by such a list? Would you be? How would you feel if you were told by God that all manner of men would hate you, that the most powerful governments on planet Earth would oppose you? They would try to restrict you and otherwise keep you from speaking out. How would you feel if you were told that religious leaders, people with degrees, 
from Bible colleges and titles would dis discount you as a heretic, would say that person does not speak for God. How would you feel if you heard from God that the populace itself would loathe you? Everybody's going to hate you. They're going to count you a fool. They're going to say you're a dangerous influence. They may be even clamoring for your persecution. They might think they're doing the world a favor if they have you killed. Isn't that exactly the way Jesus told us things would go if we followed him and did what he said? Now, why would God put his people in such a condition with such antagonists? I want you to visualize and try to get a, try to get a visceral experience of this in your head. Just visualize taking a full speed run at a pillar made of iron and hitting it head first. Can you, can you just feel how that feels? Can you imagine what that feels like? To give you an idea, if you have a 20-foot tall, 2-foot thick pillar of iron, that weighs 28,661 pounds. Can you imagine what it would be like to hit something like that? Or a bronze wall. Imagine trying to full body check a bronze wall. How bad is that bronze wall going to be hurt? How bad are you going to be hurt? seriously destroyed. Let's imagine that that iron pillar were in the middle of your house, 28,000 pounds, and you go, it clashes with the pillows. I'd like to remove this, please. Can you get it out? Can you grab a team of friends to get it out? No. There's nothing you can do about it. It's there. God's saying, Jeremiah, this is you. This is what I'm making you among this people. You're going to be something indestructible in the midst of them, immovable. I want you to be the person in the midst of this where everybody attacks you and they break themselves against you because you will not bend and you will not break. In conclusion, what did we hear from Jeremiah today? Jeremiah was a reluctant ambassador. He isn't anybody. He isn't everybody, he's just a somebody who was entrusted a stewardship over God's word. Such are you. Jeremiah was chosen from before birth to do a very specific work of God. Do you know anybody else who was chosen before birth to do a very specific work of God? Every one of you should be raising your hand. That's you. That's me. God has called you specifically. The word given to Jeremiah, the word given through Jeremiah is not a popular message and it's often going to provoke hostile responses from disinterested audiences. You have such a word. It is in your mouth. It is meant to be coming out of you. And will it provoke people? Will people dislike it? Amen, they will. And your inadequacy is irrelevant. It doesn't matter. God tells Jeremiah, dress for work and for war because he is going to be made a fulcrum of history, an unbreakable obstacle which the rebellious will destroy themselves against. God similarly is calling us to be such unshakable, bold witnesses in this generation. What our world, what our culture needs right now, what it needs most, is the same thing the people of Judah needed in the days of Jeremiah. Faithful people who will stand up and speak up because they fear God more than they fear men or the institutions of man. Let's pray. Lord God, we want to be such people. And Father, where we don't want to be such people, I pray that you would nevertheless tell us, behold, here is who I have crafted you to be. God, I pray that every one of us would be very honest and upfront with ourselves about our excuses, our rationale and reasoning for not being willing to do what you're asking us to do. God, as we go through this, this series on Jeremiah, Father, I pray that you would help us to see what it is and what we are meant to be, um, to be a faithful follower in the midst of a generation that is crooked and set itself against you. We love you, Lord. Thank you so much for your love for us. In your name we pray, amen. If you liked what you saw here, go ahead and click on that like button. And while you're at it, for more great content, go ahead and subscribe to our channel.